Malcolmus. Thanks very much for the kind introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you here tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here in such a, a, fab, a fabulous building. And as Malcolm said, the, my presentation tonight is on the feminization of nature. But by way of introduction, as Malcolm said, I'm an impassioned natural historian, basically. I love, no, love nothing better than to be you know, out, out in the field watching uh, wildlife in any shape and form. And uh, a lot of what my, and it's this sort of passion spills over into my laboratory work, into my work at Exeter. A lot of what my lab does is develop molecular tools and techniques to try and better understand how chemicals that we use and discharge in the environment impact on wildlife. And this work spans from looking at effects of pesticides on some invertebrates like bees, for example, uh, but it's particularly focused on effects of other chemicals on vertebrate systems. And these molecular tools and techniques, we also apply them into questions in, in, in relation to uh, basic ecology. Uh, and as one example, we are using DNA sequencing, for example, to look at uh, what cuckoos feed on on Dartmoor and what pipits provision young cuckoos in the nest. And the idea here is that if we can get a better understanding what resources we require, we li can link this better in terms of their environmental requirements and hope then in part inform sort of conservation, preservation activities. And so a big part of what we do in my laboratory really is about using molecular tools and techniques to help us generate knowledge for supporting environmental protection. And the story I want to tell you tonight is a story that spans 25 years, most of my, my research uh, career. And it's focused on one group of chemicals that we now know can alter and affect sexual development and function in, in wildlife, the so-called endocrine disrupting chemicals. So in terms of the structure of my presentation tonight, I'll just first introduce the issue, which many will be aware of, I know, in terms of chemicals in the environment and man's influence on the, on the chemical balance and the, and the planet. I'll then describe specifically what endocrine disruption is, for those of you who don't know what it is, and, and uh, really give some illustration in terms of the evidence we have now for effects and impacts on wildlife. Then I'll particularly focus on our work on one group of endocrine disrupting chemicals, the environmental estrogens, and the evidence we have that's causing feminizing effects in wild fish populations. And then I'll go on and talk about some very recent work that we've been doing in developing uh, new transgenic systems in fish that can inform and help us better understand where and how these chemicals are mediating their effects in, in, in fish in real time, in, in, li in live fish. And then I'll finish up with a few sort of concluding thoughts and some ideas in terms of future prospects. So we certainly live in a contaminated world that we're all familiar with in terms of stories in relation to uh, climate change and changing carbon dioxide concentrations uh, 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 globally, essentially. But from satellite imaging, we can also see visually changes and effects of, of man's activities in terms of the environment. And so here we have three satellite images. Um, the, the first one shows um, the eastern coast of Australia, and we can see plumes of, of smoke coming out into the atmosphere. These are fires which were set deliberately. Uh, and of course, those plumes of smoke are going to contain high concentrates of things like dark and furins, which we know are pretty toxic to ourselves as well as to, to wildlife. The middle image shows uh, oil wells, which were deliberately set on fire by Saddam Hussein when he had a short soiree into Kuwait and then was quickly, uh, quickly uh, expelled. And you can see these huge amounts of uh, crude black oil which are spilling out into the Gulf. And that legacy is still with us today. And then we have things like these NASA uh, satellite images that show carbon monoxide concentrations. And we can see high concentrations in places in parts of the northern hemisphere where we're burning fossil fuels to keep us warm during the winter and around regions, the belts around the equator, places like uh, South Central America where we're burning uh, forests to create grazing. So we can clearly see quite graphically, visually, that uh, we're, immediately having, we're having immediate impacts on the chemical balance. And our lives are inextricably linked to two chemicals. It's a huge, huge uh, industry, a $3 trillion uh, industry. And these chemicals, of course, come in all sorts of shapes and forms and guises and uses, from fertilizers to pesticides, pesticides to pharmaceuticals. And these will enter our bodies through a number of different routes, of course, via the diet, some enter via the water, some, of course, enter via our skin, via the application of, 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 co of cosmetics, and some actually will enter via the air, via aerosols for those volatile compounds. And just as these compounds enter our bodies, they enter the bodies of wildlife through, through similar routes of exposure. And that's particularly true for aquatic wildlife, because most of the chemicals that we use and discharge end up in aquatic environments. Now, many of these chemicals will call us, cause us no harm whatsoever. They'll pass in and pass out, and all they'll be affected and metabolized by the enzymes and the detoxification systems that we have. But for chemicals that tend to build up, so-called bioconcentrate or bioaccumulate, then, then there are potential, in some cases, good examples where these can have adverse health effects. 
And then there are some chemicals that we put out in the environment, pharmaceuticals, which we, of course, take to aid ill health, which are specifically designed to alter physiological processes in our body. And some of those processes, in fact, many of those processes are highly conserved across all vertebrates. And so if they have an effect in us, providing a sufficient concentration in the environment, they'll affect wildlife systems too. Now, we know that a lot of these chemicals that we put out there can be toxic to ourselves and to wildlife. And so some of these chemicals are so-called priority substances. So they put on these lists in Europe and such that they are regulated and or in some cases, some of those compounds have been banned from use. But there's a whole series of other chemicals that we use where we have less information, less knowledge in terms of their toxicity. And there's all sorts of so-called emerging contaminants for which we're uh, developing increasing information and knowledge indicating that they get, they're associated with adverse health effects in humans in particular, but also in wildlife. And just a few include some things called, well, some of these chemicals have got very, very long names, but PFOAs, for example, are compounds found in Teflon, for example. We now know that they're associated with things like elevated cholesterol and kidney problems. And uh, probably everyone sitting in this audience today will have PFOAs circling in, <coughs> circulating in their blood. Then we have things like bromelated flame retardants. These are compounds, chemicals which are used to retard flame, to reduce flammability. And they were incredibly widely used in actually probably most of the, 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 the products that you, you see around. We now know that some of these are problematic, some of these are being, being phased out. And the reason that they actually cause some of these effects is that their structure actually mimics some of the, the, the thyroid hormones. And then we have things like bisphenols. Bisphenol A in particular has, has, uh, has seen notoriety in recent times. And these are used in things like polycarbonate uh, polymers and, and things like epoxy resins. And these have been associated with various um, um, heart disorders and things like obesity too, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then we have pharmaceutical substances, uh, particularly steroidal estrogens, which we take, for example, as part of, sort of a contraceptive aids. And we have something called diclofenac. Probably many people in this audience have taken diclofenac at some time, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Um, and that has now been proven to be the cause of the localized extinction and, and, and uh, major collapse of many jip vultures in parts of Asia. Now, many of these chemicals are what we term endocrine disrupting chemicals. So what are endocrine disrupting chemicals? Well, when we uh, understand how our, our bodies work, the bodies of vertebrate works, for the most part, there are three major communication pathways, three major sort of uh, highways of, of communication. And they're the nervous system, the immune system, and the endocrine or the hormone system. And they, they work synergistically, but also they work in slightly different ways. So the nervous system is rather fast acting, and the information tends to be fairly short-lived. The immune system actually is a communication pathway which is often overlooked, but it's fairly uh, somewhat more slow acting. And then the hormone system or the endocrine system is much more slowly acting, but the effects tend to be longer lived. And the way that the hormone or the endocrine system works is you have a series of glands located around the body and they produce hormones which are then posted uh, into the circulation. They go to their tissues or site of reception where they bind to a receptor and then mediate and instruct a specific response. And an endocrine disruptor is a chemical or compound, and it doesn't have to be man-made, it can be natural too, that can interact with that receptor to alter growth, development, and or reproduction. And it can mediate that effect in the, in, in the individual that's being exposed at that point in time. But in some cases, you get delayed effects, and you can get effects in, in the subsequent progeny from that individual. And the way that they work, these endocrine disrupting chemicals, for the most part, historically, their, their definition was binding to a receptor. So the reason they, they can interact with the hormone receptors in our body uh, is that these chemicals are sufficiently structurally similar to our endogenous hormones to sit in that pocket, to sit in, sit in that receptor po pocket. And they're a term, uh, uh, termed as uh, receptor agonists, so they stimulate a response. Then there's a whole series of other chemicals which we know out there which are similar in terms of structure. So they come along, they bind to a hormone receptor, but they're not quite right. They don't quite fit in that pocket or they don't allow for something called a conformational change. So they block that receptor. So they act as hormone receptor antagonists. So they block any, any, uh, that pathway. So now the native hormone can't get access to that site. So that's two major ways in which chemicals can interact to affect uh, targeted uh, mediated um, um, hormone disruption. But as we've learned over the last um, eight to 10 years now, there are all sorts of other pathways in which these chemicals can interact with the endocrine system to alter endocrine function. 
They can affect things like the enzymes, which are involved in the biosynthesis of the hormones and or breakdown, and they can affect things like how those hormones are excreted too. So what's the evidence that endocrine disruption is occurring out there in the real world? So there's evidence in humans and an increasing body of evidence in humans, and much of the, uh, the publications have been focused around falling sperm count. And there are strong associations in particular with uh, certain groups of people, particularly those people who are associated, for example, with uh, um, um, pesticide use and pesticide production, and uh, both reduced sperm count and reduced uh, sperm, sperm quality. There's also associations between increase in, in human-dependent cancers and association to these endocrine disrupting chemicals. But as you can appreciate, it's very difficult to put your finger on saying it's specifically that chemical or that class of chemicals causing that particular effect in humans. Because, of course, in terms of our lifestyles have, have changed o o over recent years, we're exposed to complex mixtures of chemicals. So separating out individual chemicals and those phenotypes, those endpoints, is incredibly difficult to do. But the weight of evidence is increasing for certain sets of these endocrine disrupting chemicals because things like laboratory-based studies with mice, sometimes over multiple generations, again are supporting links between certain classes of chemicals and things like reproductive um, uh, abnormalities, reduced sperm count, and in some cases cancers too. But perhaps the strongest evidence in association between specific groups of chemicals and alterations in sexual function and development come from studies in wildlife. And wildlife spanning all the vertebrate phyla. So there's good evidence for endocrine disruption, for example, in otters in North America, where they have alterations in testis uh, development and reduced penis size. Those are associated with increased concentrations of chemicals that mimic and di disrupt thyroid function. And those effects have been mimicked by dosing uh, mink with, with these particular chemicals, PCBs and something called bromelated flame retardants. Uh, uh, you can mimic those effects that you see in wild otters. There's evidence in pinnipeds, in, in, in marine uh, seals, um, for things like uh, 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 reduced sexual fun uh, function, uh, reduced sexual development, and things like immunosuppression. And then there's good evidence from studies in birds, particularly in North America, especially in around the Great Lakes, exposure largely to uh, PCBs, but some other organochlorine compounds too, and effects on the endocrine uh, uh, system, particularly actually in fish-eating birds, uh, things like grebes, and some of the higher raptors like the osprey. And there's really some really intriguing studies just coming out from the, uh, Canada and then Germany too, where lab-based studies to some of these chemicals, particularly those that can mimic estrogens, are showing that if you expose birds during early life, during early development, some of these compounds can change the way the brain develops. And one thing that's coming to, to, to the fore now is that male birds are affected in terms of their song and, their, and the song pattern that they produce. And if you're a drab little bird, like this grasshopper warbler, a male, song is everything in terms of clearly commanding territory and attracting a female. There's good evidence also as we move down the, the vertebrate phyla for endocrine disruption in alligators, and particularly from the work from Lou Gillette, who's, uh, Lou Gillette, who's uh, sadly passed away a couple of years ago. His work on alligators in uh, uh, Lake Apopka in Florida, showing strong association between certain types of organic chemicals and alterations in reproductive function and development, including things like reduced penis size in, in the alligators. In amphibia too, uh, particularly in frogs, uh, in, again in parts of North America, associations between alteration in sexual development and function and exposure to uh, various herbicides. Also those herbicides, when you do controlled lab studies, are shown to affect things like voice and song pattern in those frogs as well. But probably overall, collectively, the strongest evidence, weight of evidence for endocrine disruption in wildlife comes from studies uh, in fish. And this is where, for me, the story starts about 25 years ago when I was a, a postdoc and I went to Brunel uh, University. And there had been some initial observations by um, some anglers that there were some intersex fish. There were some fish in the Thames catchment living a sewage treatment lagoon which had, uh, which had feminized responses. Their gonads, their testes contained uh, some oocyte. And CFAS at the time followed up some of this work and also showed that some of these male fish were producing a female protein. It's called regular genin. Basically, it's a yolk protein normally only produced um, by females, and it's produced in response to estrogen. And my project working with CFAS was to go around um, various rivers around the UK, put fish in cages in effluent discharges 
from sewage treatment works and see where these male fish responded to this effluent by producing this yolk protein. And actually, the findings, this is at 28 different sewage treatment works around the UK, and this is just the data for four of those sites. The results were quite astounding in the sense of this. So here we have the amount of vitlogenin. It's on a log scale, so the yolk protein here, and these are different sites. Here's, here's the control site here. There was a massive induction of this yolk protein for only a two or three week exposure to this effluent. In fact, half, in some cases, more of the blood protein was this yolk protein in these male fish after this two or three week exposure. And that work established that effluents were estrogenic to fish. And there was lots of work that followed up from that where fish were placed in cages up and downstream of effluent discharges to find out how long a stretches of these rivers were estrogenic to fish. And in some cases, five, six, and in one instance, even 10 kilometers downstream of an effluent discharge, these fish were still producing, these male fish were still producing this yolk protein. So they're producing yolk protein. Does that really matter for wild fish? Well, in fish, unlike in mammals, sex is pretty plastic. And so you can take a male fish, a genetically male fish, and if you expose it high to high amounts of estrogen, you can change the gonadal sex. You can switch from a testis into an ovary. And likewise, if you take a genetic female and you expose it to high amounts of androgen, you can actually create a, a, a sperm. You can actually create a testis. And if you uh, take a genetic male or female and expose it to intermediate doses of, of these steroids, you can get intersex. And that's where oocytes start to develop within the testes. So a hypothesis in, in terms of this for wild fish, studying a species called the roach, it's really common, found throughout British rivers, lives pretty well in, in lowland waters, was that we would expect to see intersex in this species if these fish were being significantly impacted in terms of these uh, estrogenic effluent discharges. And actually, the data were, quite, again, quite astounding. We looked at 51 sites, and at 44 of those sites, the male fish had oocytes in the testes and or they had something called an ovarian cavity, which is another female reproductive structure. So feminization of a fish in British rivers was absolutely widespread. Now, it's very difficult, as we know, to draw uh, uh, cause-effect relationships between an environmental parameter and a particular condition. So actually, we spent probably about the next 10 years, to be honest with you, exposing fish in real effluent discharges from sewage treatment works. And by doing that, we could show that we could induce all of those feminized responses that we saw in our wild fish. We could induce the ovarian cavity, we could induce that yolk protein, and we could induce a true intersex, the presence of oocytes within the testes. So we know it's effluent from these sewage treatment works, which is feminizing these fish. Now, in most cases, it took 20, 30, or 40 percent of uh, a concentration of effluent to induce these feminized responses. My, one might think, well, surely that's not realistic. Actually, it is. For the most part, many rivers in the UK, a, a major proportion of the flow is made up of effluent from wastewater treatment works. 20 or 30 percent is not uncommon. And in some cases, during the summer months, 70, even 80 percent of the flow of the river can be made up of treated sewage effluent. Our rivers are relatively small, and the dilution rate of effluent is relatively uh, low compared to the, many of our European counterparts. So the next question was, so we know it's effluent inducing these feminized responses. It's the whodunit question. What chemicals are actually ju inducing these effects? And a number of groups started to investigate this, largely looking in the effluent discharge. Uh, we worked with Liz Hill at University of Sussex to look to see what got in the fish, what chemicals were concentrated in the fish. And I, I should apologize, this is quite a, a complicated slide, but I'll just talk you through it. So we took our roach and we placed them in the effluent discharge. And then you can look at lot into lots of different tissues to analyze to see what chemicals are present. It's relatively easy to use the bile because it's an easy medium to extract. Liz took this, she fractionated it out by HPLC, so just a fractionation process. And then she looked to see uh, which one of those fractions are estrogenic. And a really clever system was used to do this. So we have here a recombinant yeast that has the human estrogen receptor incorporated into it, such that if there's an estrogen in that medium, it changes a chromogenic substance from a yellow to a red. So simply, by taking these fractions and putting them in this yeast, and if it goes red, we know there's an estrogen in there. She did this, and then she uh, uh, um, used things like GCMS and uh, LCNMR, so other analytical techniques to identify what those chemicals were. 
And this is a fish that's um, not been exposed to the effluent. This is exposed to uh, fresh water. And here's a fish that be, that's been exposed to that effluent. There were all sorts of estrogens being taken up into the bodies of these fish. And they included industrial products like non alphenol and its polyethoxic surfactants, things like in your fairy liquid and in paint and this sort of thing, plasticizers. And then we have estrone and, and estradiol. These are natural estrogens that emanate from, from, from women coming through sewage treatment works. We had ethanol estradiol from the contraceptive pill. And we also picked out things like this. This is dihydroequilenin. It's a horse estrogen, and it's used in hormone replacement therapy. And so what happens is when mares are pregnant, they uh, have huge amounts of this estrogen, and they extract the estrogen from those mares, and then they put it into HRT, and it ends up in the fish. So all sort of the key thing here was that these fish were sucking up all sorts of uh, chemicals uh, which were in their immediate environment, all sorts of all sorts of estrogens. And so it's likely these feminized responses we're seeing uh, is a combination effect. Is this estrogens in are these estrogens in concert? But there's some exquisitely potent compounds in that mixture, and one of those is ethanol estradiol. Of course, it's potent. It's designed to be potent. Essentially, it's designed as a contraceptive estrogen. And we've done a whole series of lab-based studies, including exposing these fish up to two years in a laboratory, to show that ethanol estradiol at concentrations of parts of a nanogram per litre, tiny, tiny amounts, can actually induce vitalogenin production, that yolk protein. It can induce intersex oocytes within the testis. And actually, if you expose it just a few nanograms per litre, four nanograms per litre, over two years, you can cause complete sex reversal. So those males turn out to be females. So, Although there's a combination of estrogens these fish are sucking up, ethanol estrogen is exquisitely potent in inducing these feminized responses. But life's more complicated than that, of course, uh, in the sense that if you, if you analyze these tissues uh, from these exposed fish, it never ceases to amaze me what an incredible mix of compounds these fish are taking up. So this is some of the compounds which have been measured in the testes of these roach exposed to an effluent. And basically, it's a mirror, it's a mimic of what we're taking uh, in, in terms of things like the pharmaceuticals. So there are these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, that we take, ibuprofen, for example, and naproxen. There are SSI, these antidepressants, so they're stuffed full of antidepressants. Um, there are these endocrine disrupting chemicals, plasticizers and other in industrial compounds. And there's all sorts of other xenobiotics as well. And what we know now from some detailed studies is that a number of these compounds can have effects at other parts of that stereogenic pathway. So again, we've got these other chemicals acting in concert to affect steroidogenesis in these fish. In fact, now about 1,000, probably a bit more now, probably 1,100 chemicals have been identified which have um, some endocrine disrupting activity. Now, of course, they're not all potent. Some are incredibly weak. But over 1,000 compounds have been shown to have endocrine disrupting activity, about 200 of those with estrogenic activity. And uh, Andreas Kordenkamp uh, has done an estimate that maybe 8% of all chemicals that we use have so-called anti-androgen activity. Uh, we discharge maybe about 30 or 40,000 chemicals on a regular basis, and there's probably about 90,000 or so chemicals out there uh, produced by that. So, but if, but if, it, if it's wildlife, it, it, when it's human health, we protect at the level of the individual. But when it comes to wildlife, we protect at the level, rightly or wrongly, we protect at the level of the population. And so for any action to be done about any particular chemical, we have to be able to show uh, provide strong evidence that there's a likelihood or there is a population level effect or impact. So in our next studies, what we did was we started to look to see whether these intersex fish, these feminized males in a river, could reproduce. Can they breed? And the way we did this was to bring these fish uh, into the laboratory. So we had these collections of fish that included normal females, and then a series of, of males, some of which were normal and some of which were feminized, some of which were intersex. And we allowed them to breed in control conditions in these tanks and laboratories. What we did simultaneously, we de developed genetic markers using something called uh, DNA microsatellites so we could genetically fingerprint each individual. So each one of those individuals in that breeding matrix, we can take a little fin clip and we can identify that individual. And using those microsatellites, you can also identify the offspring that they produce. And so we're therefore, once we kill the fish at the end of the study and look to see what their gonad looks like, are they feminized, are they not feminized, how feminized they are, you can then link um, how feminized they are, this is just a measure of increasing feminization here, against how successful they were in terms of their reproductive output. 
And you can see this relationship here. So with the increasing degree of feminization, perhaps not surprisingly, those male fish have a reduced capability to actually breed, to, 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 to sire offspring. And certainly, if you are moderately or towards severely uh, intersex, then your breeding capabilities are pretty low. So we know, therefore, that if you're intersex, that matters to the individual. That matters to the individual male. So the next charge and challenge was to try and find out, well, are wild populations being really affected? Uh, is there anything we can do to get a real measure in terms of wild populations living in British River to say, well, they are changing. They're fundamentally different because they're being exposed to these estrogenic um, efferents. And this was a huge, huge charge. One of the real difficulties, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, work in a f if you work in a field of ecology and environmental biology, is that rarely do we have really good data sets, long-term data sets, monitoring data sets for any uh, particular wildlife population. In the case of fish in British rivers, we have patchy data, um, but we don't have sufficient data to be able to say what are the, the, the long-term trends for things like roach populations in British rivers. And so we can't really do this assessment based on numbers, what's here, what, what, what's here and now. But there's another possible measure that we can look at to get a feel for whether effluents might be having an effect. And that's to look at something called the effective breeding size, the effective population breeding size. So I showed you in that last slide that if you're moderately to severely uh, intersex, you are less able to breed. Now, if that's true in wild populations, you might expect that fewer individuals in those populations are contributing to the next generation. So our hypothesis here is that if effluent concentration or estrogen concentration is important in terms of determining the size of the breeding population, we'd expect this sort of relationship. If it's not, the data should look like this. And again, we were doing this using DNA microsatellites. It was largely based around the Thames Basin. We did some other study sites as well. But it was a big, big study. It was a huge investment, cost a lot of money. Um, we looked at 37 sites, at 30 fish at each one of those sites. And we used 14 DNA microsatellites to be able to uh, uh, fingerprint these, these individuals. And to take a, 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 a uh, the shortcut uh, there, if you like, uh, this, is the, this is the data we got. So here's the concentration, the amount of effluent in the river, uh, at the estradiol equivalent here, and here's the effective breeding population size. And there's a trend. There's a tantalizing trend in terms of indicating, and certainly it's the case that once you get the high estrogen content, then your effective breeding population is always pretty low. Here, it's much, much more variable. But if you apply the appropriate statistics here, there's no effect relationship. So from that, albeit fairly limited study, we conclude that actually these, this feminization in these fish is not having an overt impact on those wild fish, which is good news. So that's the story to some extent of where we are in relation to looking at the feminizing effect of estrogen in, in, British, and in, in British rivers. Um, some of the questions we're trying to address now is that can and have these fish adapted over time? And if so, what are the genetic mechanisms for that adaptation? Now, when we talk about estrogens, however, estrogens aren't just involved with controlling female reproduction. Estrogens are pleiotropic. They're hugely important in the bodies for many, many processes in humans as they are in fish. And in fact, when you look in terms of the role of estrogens, they're fundamentally important for male reproduction. Gentlemen, if you didn't have some estrogen, you would be infertile. They're also involved with a whole variety of things like growth, bone development, the immune system, and things like calcium homeostasis too. And estrogen signaling in our cells and other vertebrates is incredibly complex. So we have two so-called nuclear estrogen receptors. Fish have three nuclear receptors. There are also membrane-bound receptors, so-called G-coupled receptors. There are also estrogen-related receptors. And there's also something called crosstalk, where, where it's, uh, different uh, hormone receptors uh, uh, cross-mesh with one another. Um, it's incredibly complex in terms of a signaling process. And it's probably the case, and I'm sticking my neck out a bit here, that probably every cell in our body, at some time in its ontogeny, some time in its development, has and expresses an estrogen receptor. So if this is the case, then clearly, if we're being exposed to these environmental estrogens, there's lots of other potential effects that these estrogens might have in, in, in our bodies and in the bodies of fish. And this was a challenge that we had probably about seven or eight years ago. And we were looking to find out, well, how can we better start to understand and analyze where and how these chemicals are going in the body to induce potential biological, biological effects? And of course, this is, this is where transgenics came in. Um, 
Now, transgenics are where you genetically manipulate an organism to have a desired trait. And that might be, for example, in the cattle industry, you might manipulate them to, for greater or faster growth rate or, or better food, food conversion. And just, just as, 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 as in the cattle industry, in the case of ecotoxicology, we can genetically manipulate a fish and link it to a fluorophore. So we, so we can insert or, or, or manipulate a, a genetic target site and link it to a fluorophore, such that if we now expose, in this case, this fish here, to a chemical of interest, it will fluoresce green in the target site that's receiving that chemical and responding to that chemical. It's simply a way where we can visualize in live fish, in real time, where, the chemical, where that class of chemical is going and how it's interacting. Uh, in the fish. And so we developed one of these um, for estrogens in zebrafish. Zebrafish are tiny little fish. They originate from the Gangetic Plain. They're used hugely in terms of all sorts of work in developmental biology and also in, in, in medical uh, science too. They're relatively easy maintained in the laboratory. And there's lots of genetic information out there, so it's relatively easy to, to, mani to manipulate them. And what we did is we created two so-called genetic constructs and, and, and merged these two constructs such that we were able to do this. And so we have uh, a xenoestrogen, or those estrogens I talked about in the environment. It comes along, it binds to any one of those estrogen receptors I talked about earlier. And then the genetic sort of engineering we've done is we have three estrogen response elements. That's the bit that binds the receptor with, with, with the ligand, linked to something called a GAL4. That, that just produces a protein. And then in the second construct, we have something that binds that GAL4, it's called a UAS, linked to that green fluorescent protein. And the whole idea of this is that now if an estrogen it comes along, it will bind to that receptor, it will produce that protein, which gives us an amplification in terms of the signal. So we can better see the response. That binds the US, and then we get this green fluorescent protein. So now we have a system which we can expose our fish to chemicals we suspect for being environmental estrogens as individuals or mixtures, and we can trace where they go in the bodies of the fish and how the fish uh, responds. And so we can look at, and here we're looking at ethanol estradiol, we can look at things like responses in the different tissues, in case in what sort of effective concentrations induce those responses, are they environmentally relevant? And we can look at the ontogeny, the timing, the temporal responses in those fish as well. They provide these wonderful integrative systems to better help us better understand how uh, chemicals are interacting in the bodies of the fish. Now, we've used this fish. Actually, we've taken that original fish, and we've crossed it into another fish where, we, where it lacks skin pigmentation, so we can better visualize now right deep into the, into the bodies of these fish. What we can do now is we can start to profile chemicals that we suspect to be environmental estrogens. And so, and this is what we started to do. So here we're profiling different concentrations of ethanol estradiol and looking at responses. That's non-alphenol, that's that surfactant I mentioned earlier. And we're doing it for things like natural estrogens because things like phytoestrogens, they'll trigger some of these responses. And here for bisphenol A as well. Now, from this profiling, what we're starting to find is that some estrogens have similar, similar effects and similar targets, but other estrogens, particular target, um, uh, um, other target sites, which the general pool of estrogens don't. And a really interesting one that came up was bisphenol A. So this is bisphenol A here. It's not especially potent compared to some of the steroids, but we kept finding the heart was coming up in terms of when we're exposing it to this bisphenol A. And there have been a number of data sets coming out from the, the United States in particular saying, uh, drawing uh, relationships between bisphenol A and things like heart problems in humans. So we set out to have a look at this. So here's bisphenol A. It's uh, very widely used. Actually, bisphenol A was originally designed to be a human contraceptive. It was originally designed to go in the pill. And it was just the fact that ethanol estradiol came on very shortly after that actually it was thrown out because it's incredibly weak compared to ethanol estradiol. So we shouldn't really be uh, that surprised that it, that it is environmental estrogen. But people seem to have forgot about that. And it's used widely now as a bulk chemical, essentially, in things like plasticizers. It's used, it's ubiquitous. It's, it's, it's all around us. It's in so, so many products. Um, it's in things like uh, uh, this uh, pr uh, printing uh, ink, for example. It's, it was in baby bottles. It was taken out. They've now replaced that. It's interesting, it caused a big hoo-ha, of course, in terms of having in baby bottles and, and baby toys. And so they replaced it with things like bisphenol S and bisphenol D, which are also estrogenic. But at least they can say bisphenol A free now. So anyway. Uh, so uh, and it's, it's a weak estrogen, and its mode of action is quite complex. Uh, um, it's, it's, it'll be in the circulation of everyone sitting in the audience here today. And in mammals, it's not 
so much the pair and compound that's really active is its metabolites, something called M MBP, essentially. So our bodies try to bake it down to make it less active, but actually becomes more active as, as, an, as, an, as, a, as an estrogen. And as I say, it's found just about everywhere in the environment. So we use this little transgenic fish to try and find out, well, what's happening? What's this bisphenol I doing? Why is it acting? Where is it acting in the heart? Quite a bit of data here. And so what we've done, we've exposed our fish to bisphenol A, and then we've dissected out the hearts, and we've actually stained it with an antibody so you can see the heart a little bit better. But what you can find with bisphenol A, it's not the heart, it's not the myocardium, it's not the muscle that's responding. Actually, it's the valves. It's the outflow cushion and the AV valves. So the target site for bisphenol A are the valves and the valve structures are within the heart. Now, if you look for some MBP, remember that's a metabolite in mammals of bisphenol A. Now we actually find it's even more significant, even more pronounced, and concentration of parts of the microgram per liter are interacting with those heart valves. And I just put that to illustrate to you the power of these models to be able to better discern where and how these chemicals are interacting in the body. And we could do all sorts of other elegant and cool things as well with other molecular technology. So we can take that transgenic fish now we know that bisphenol A is having an effect on the heart valves. We can say, well, which signaling pathway is it going through? Is it working through estrogen receptor 1 or 2 or 2A or 2B or estrogen-related receptors? And there are other molecular techniques that we can do, something called morpholinos, where you can block those different, the messages for those different receptors. And if we do that in combination with the transgenic, we can actually show that actually it's estrogen receptor 1 that's mediating that pathway. So these tools are really, really powerful to help us better discern and understand how these chemicals, where these chemicals are acting in the body and also how they're acting in our body. What I was really surprised about when, when the PhD and the postdoc was doing this work was that when they started to expose these fish to these estrogens, some of the target tissues I expected, so things like the liver, things like the gonads, we expected to come up. But we started to find a lot of nerve tissue started to come up, particularly the peripheral nervous tissue. You can see these little, little uh, neuromasts here, and things like the ear ganglion, and these, here's some more neuromasts here. Um, the peripheral nervous system was really sensitive and responsive to these estrogens. What's more, when one of the postdocs started looking in the brain, and this is the brain of an early developing zebrafish, and, and we found that the, there's really responsive regions in a region called the telencephalon and the olfactory bulbs. Here's the activity here, and it changes with the ontogeny. Um, and we know that estrogens are really important in, in mammals in terms of brain repair and, and, and brain development. And so we, here we can clearly see those estrogens are directly interacting with the peripheral nervous system and the brain, as well as the things we know in relation to the endocrine system. And studies have also been done to show that some of these estrogens can affect behavior in fish as well. So we know that these, this is a, a changed a little bit away in terms of we think of what an endocrine disrupting chemical is. We love to pigeonhole things, of course we do, because it's easier in terms of handling things in silos. But when we think about the communication systems in our body, the endocrine system is not mutually exclusive from the immune system or uh, from, from the nervous system. And here we're finding that these agents are directly affecting things like the development of the brain or the response and, and uh, interacting with the peripheral nervous system. We know from some mammal studies now that they directly interact with various immune tissues. And so this is really expanding our understanding, really, and, and uh, the pathways of interactions of some of these chemicals across these different uh, signaling systems. And there are all sorts of, uh, that's just one example, there are all sorts of transgenic fish which are now being developed, which are helping us in terms of understand how chemicals interact uh, in, in, in the bodies of fish. And what I would say, in terms of those interaction sites, 70% of all the interaction sites for known pharmaceuticals are highly conserved in fish within mammals. So if they have effects in, in fish, the likelihood is that some of these effects will be occurring in mammals. Real, one of the biggest challenges in toxicology and ecotoxicology is trying to separate out a specific effect with a specific chemical. We need to better understand how chemicals interact and what the so-called mixture effects are. So what we're doing now is we're trying to engineer our fish further to help us understand how these chemicals uh, in concert interact in the bodies of the fish. And this is a model we've just, just developed, haven't published it yet. And so we've taken up that estrogen responsive fish. And what we've done, we've replaced that green fluorescent protein with something called chaida. Chaida comes from, it's a fluorophore that comes from coral, comes from, come, come, comes from the sea. And chaida uh, emanates from the Japanese term meaning, meaning uh, maple, Japanese maple. And what happens with chaida is that 
Um, if you expose the fish to oestrogens, it'll, it'll glow green just like the green fluorescent protein does. But if you then expose it to UV light, it changes from green to red, and thus the chida from green to red. And so what we can start to do now is expose our fish to, in this case, an oestrogen, see how it responds, and then we can expose it to UV light and fix that green red. Now what we can do is we can expose it to further chemicals to see how that original exposure affects the subsequent response. So we can start to look at how the ontogeny, uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, lifetime exposure of chemicals affects the, w uh, the responses subsequently in, in later life. And we've been starting to do this, and sorry there's a little bit of data, but I just wanted, and we looked at it across different tissues. And so here we're looking at the response to ethanol, estradiol, genistein as a natural lesion, and BPA. And just the take home here is that if you now expose during early life to something like ethanol, estradiol, and then allow the fish to recover and expose it to other estrogens, the response is different. It's much enhanced for these estrogens. And so it's a good example, really, that we, we need to better understand the history of exposure to chemicals if we're going to better understand <coughs> what the implications might be for health and, and for, for wildlife and for ourselves as well. And there are all sorts of other transgenics that we're developing now. We're not limited to a single interaction site. We can look at multiple interaction sites now. So this is, a, again, a zebrafish brain here. We're looking at it, this is at the olfactory bulbs where they smell, and the telencephalon here. And this is one where we've merged uh, uh, two different target sites. So the estrogen receptor now with, uh, with something called aromatase. That's an enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen, so really important in terms of sex uh, 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 steroid bio biosynthesis. And so we can look at multiple interaction sites in the brain. And I'm, going to fin and, I'm going to fi and I'm going to finish on this by just showing you just a, a few little videos here in relation to, to this model here, if I can find it here. So, so this is a live zebrafish, and we're looking at a brain. And this is one that's uh, unfortunately lost in translation by looks at between PC and Mac, but anyway. Um, so this is an untreated one. This is a, a so-called G-CAMP model. And what we have here, we have that green fluorescent protein, but it's been modified and, and, and it has a calcium sensor. So, and it's linked to every neuron in the brain. So when a nerve fires in the brain, it produces calcium, and then that triggers that green fluorescent. So if we look at this top left-hand one first, this is a this is a, a fish that's there we go. This is this is a fish that's at rest essentially. So this is a live fish. This is the brain. We can see a little bit of firing here, a little bit of firing down here, but it's telencephalon here, olfactory bulbs here. So it's at rest. It's pretty chilled out. Now what we can do if we expose it to oh let's go back. If we expose it now to this compound, look how the pattern changes. Now you can clearly see there's much more activity. It's quite obvious, isn't it? And you can see some really areas of, 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 of significant and severe intensity. That's one particular pattern. And then if we do something like strictine, we know all know, all know strictine's a poison. Different in terms of its localization and its firing pattern. Then if we expose to something like 4-AP, which affects, um, calc uh, that affects potassium channels, now you can really start to see some major activity happening here. And this is where it's just hitting the brain now. So what we can do with this model now, this zebrafish now, is that we can take this transgenic fish and we can we actually put it into these little tubes here, the agar gels. When fish are really young, this is before they become sentient, so this is before first feeding, because they're about to 96 hours post-fertilization. Um, they actually breathe largely through their skin. So you can put them in agar, essentially, and they, they'll function fine, they'll live fine. You saw that um, neural pattern firing, it's pretty chilled out, it's pretty less, uh, uh, um, not having an undue effect on it. You can put them in these tubes, and then you use something called light sheet microscopy. And that's a technique where you can put that transgenic and you can record that activity across the brain in 3D. So you can record activity across the whole brain, essentially. And because it's a live fish, you can do it in real time as well. So you can get 4D profiling of how that brain is responding to whatever chemical that we're exposing it to. And then you can build up these spatial temporal patterns of where this activity is occurring. We have some very sort of clever uh, people who are developing various algorithms to actually distill this information out. Then you can start to build up this 4D profiling of how a chemical and where it mediates effects in the brain. And the idea now is we're trying to take this to the next level in terms of link those phenotypes or link those, those responses to behavioral responses. And the utility of this system potentially is that now we can start to look at how chemicals might affect 
behaviours as well as things like overt physiology. You can imagine if chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals or whatever chemicals are affecting behaviour, then there's a real potential to affect how they exist, how they live in our natural system. So to finish with, um, I hope I've sort of convinced you tonight or, or, or gave you some insight in, into endocrine disruption. And certainly one of the things that endocrine disruption has certainly done, as far as I'm concerned, in 25 years, is it started to change the paradigm in a way that we think about chemicals in the environment. It's, it's taken us away from thinking about overt toxicity, more to thinking about the more subtle effects of chemicals in the body, which can nevertheless manifest with quite significant effects, phenotypes uh, uh, down the road. Certainly, it's the case that environmental estrogens, probably the best study group of, of endocrine disrupting chemicals, they're out there in the environment and they are having effects at the level of the individual. Now, to what extent populations are in be, uh, being impacted is very, very difficult to, to ascertain at this point. But certainly, in relation to our studies in fish, albeit relatively limited, big studies, but still limited, to certain uh, uh, rivers, uh, parts of the rivers, is that we're not finding any effect in terms of breeding structure, or at least in terms of genetic variability in those populations. One of the biggest challenges, I think, for us as ecotoxicology is understanding the resilience of wildlife populations. To what extent are there buffers? buffers? You know, I, I do quite a lot with industry, and, and uh, you know, they're always saying that you know, academics are great at finding problems, but not very good at, at, at solving them. And I suppose to some extent that, 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 that is true, and that's part of our job as well. Um, but one of, the, one of the real challenges we need to get to better grips with to understand to what extent populations can cope with some of those anthropogenic influences that, that we're imposing on them, particularly in relation, from my point of view, sort of the chemicals and chemical balances. So really understanding how they adapt uh, in those environments and can they adapt and rates of adaptations are fundamentally important questions which I think we need to try and better, better, better address. Certainly, I hope I've been able to in, in convince you tonight in terms of molecular technologies which are now available to us. I mean, my career has fundamentally changed in the last decade. I was, I was funny, I was giving a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, and there's a, a, someone from industry from Syngenta there, and they always tend to give you some challenging questions. And he just made a comment, and he said, he said Charles, your work has gone from throwing... Uh, fish in, I think he said, fish in buckets in rivers, uh, developing some of those cutting edge technologies in 10 years. How do, you think, how do you think industry will ever keep up, basically, in terms of you know, how, you know, how, how they can sort of regulate chemicals? And, and they have a point. Molecular technologies have fundamentally changed what we can do in biology generally, but certainly in the case of ecotoxicology. And these tools that we've got now can be applied both to helping us understand population level impacts, as well as this really detailed level mechanistic studies in, at, at the levels of uh, individual tissue cells and even finer that. And certainly I think transgenics are playing a ma major role in that. So just let me finish now by acknowledging lots of people have funded this work um, over the years. I'm very grateful to them, and these are the members of my immediate team at the moment who've, who've provided some of the data for, that I've presented to you today. And uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you uh, for your patience.